Okay, welcome back. Let's get into chapter two. Let's project the notes. Now, in chapter two, again, Paul is reiterating uh, uh, why he did not visit them for the second time when he was returning back from Macedonia, right? Uh, because as I mentioned, while going to Macedonia, he changed his mind. He went to Corinth. Uh, it was not a very fruitful visit. And then he went uh, he went back, and then as he was returning, they they wondered why he he went to Macedonia from there, and then from Macedonia, as he was returning back to Ephesus, he did not visit Corinth, right? So he's now in chapter two, he's he's explaining to them the reason for the change, right? Uh, but I determined this within myself that I would not come to you in sorrow, for if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad? but the one who is made sorrowful by me. And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I come, I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you that all my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. And it's, it's, it's so... So touching to read this, right? Paul is reiterating his decision not to visit them because he's saying, see, if I come and you are sorrowful, then I'm also sorrowful. But the thing is, you are the ones who should give me joy, right? Uh, so I didn't want to come because, you know, I don't want you, I don't want you to be sorrowful, nor do I want to become sorrowful, right? But here, it, it, what was important is Paul also says that correction was important, right? It's not like, you know, uh, he was pleasing them. Okay, it's not like, okay, do what you want, but I want you all to be joyful. No, Paul had to bring correction. Correction is part of discipline, right? It may not be always welcome. Some people receive it well. Some people don't receive it well. But regardless of that, correction has to be done. And when we're correcting people, we do it in truth and love. And that is what the Apostle Paul did. And he's been in saying in verse 4, I did this correction. I, I corrected you because of the love that I have so abundantly for you. But after this unpleasant visit, what was even more sorrowful for Paul was there was some more correction that was needed. And he could not do it face to face. He could not see them sorrowful. So he decided he will write a letter instead. So later on in the coming chapters, he does confront a few problems within the church again and among the believers. Um, yes, just a moment. Yes, Rupa. Uh, Rupa and Maggie have raised your hands. Yes. Yes, Rupa. Uh, you have something to share? Sir, sorry, maybe it's the oh, last by, by one. Mistake. Okay, no problem. Mangi, do you have something to share? Uh, ye yes, Pastor. Um, yes, go ahead. Just need your your help. Maybe you can clarify it and give us uh, some guidance. Um, but as we are reading the book of of uh, Corinth Corinthian, with uh. We can see that Paul had a problem with his uh, temperament, and uh, if, even him not visiting the, the Corinthian church for the second time, which was because of what he said in the first time, although it was good, however, it created a problem. Um, and now he cannot visit the church he loved because he's afraid that you'll be, he will create more trouble and more sorrow, so that he has to to write. So for me as a, as a believer, uh, if I'm, 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 I'm a planted church, I will love, even if I have to correct people, I will, I will go there and confront them because of the love I have and the affection I have for, for them. So my question is, what can we learn from, from, uh, from Paul's, Paul's love? Because we see that he had problems with Barnabas, and even if at the end they reconciled and he worked with, with uh, uh, Mark again, 
but because of his temperament, he had a problem with them. Uh, we see twice he's asking people to be given to Satan, not only in the book of Corinthians, but also I think it's in the book of Timothy, he asks the church to give someone to Satan again. So what can we learn and what can we avoid so that yes. we do things in a better way? Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much, Mackie. Now, uh, here's the first thing I would like to say. The Apostle Paul was a great, wonderful man of God, wrote two, three fourths of the New Testament, full of revelation from the Holy Spirit. But the Apostle Paul was a man. He did make mistakes, right? As you mentioned, Paul and Barnabas, that conflict. Then later on, here at the church, right? Uh, he was quite stern in his in his in his, in his correcting. Right. And also, if you see later on, uh, when uh, I think he's standing in front of Agrippa and uh, one of the high priests had hit him and he says, uh, he says to them, you whitewashed wall. Right. So we see now Apostle Paul was somebody who was, you know, probably very stern in the way he did things. Uh, but we also see that the Apostle Paul did not visit the Corinthian church because they the the church was sorrowful and i understand you're saying that you know i would like to go and if like if you planted a church you would like to go and visit and he did that he wrote the letter and then he visited them also but they did not uh receive him or receive the letter in the right way they were sorrowful right now what he thought was if i stay back and if i again bring some more corrections Right, if I visit them and I again bring some more corrections, not only are they going to be sorrowful, but even I'm going to be sorrowful because of what's happening within the church. So it was not like, uh, again, I want to just mention, I, I heard you, you said the word Mangi, you said the word fearful. He was not fearful, right? So he was, he was being wise, I would say, right? Uh, just so that, you know, it doesn't cause too many conflicts or too many problems. So he felt that this issue is better resolved if I write it down, I write it to them, right? So it was not that he was fearful to visit them, right? Uh, you see, in the first letter, he was stern. He, was, he gives all these corrections, uh, but he's not saying, he's not apologizing for it, right? So uh, what we can learn from Paul is, yes, he did, as a leader, as an apostle, he did correct sternly, but he also did it with love. And he goes on in chapter one uh, of Second Corinthians, what we just saw was he says to them, it is the love of God. I didn't, I didn't shout at you. I didn't, I didn't correct you because I want to dominate your faith, but I'm doing it because of the love of Christ. So what we can learn is yes, it's good to, in terms of uh, now, uh, right. If you see now, if you have a church, uh, be willing to, uh, first confront in a in a you know in a quieter in a softer way, right? It looks like the apostle Paul was you know the first letter itself writing so sternly and angrily. Uh, so something that we can learn is we can avoid getting upset very fast for things like this. But the truth has to be told, right? Like what we mentioned, Paul said the truth, but he could have said it in a little softer way in a little kinder way uh, but it was that you know it's that uh, holy anger i would say uh, how can you as a church do this when i have shared the gospel with you and now you're saying one i'll follow paul one will follow apollos then you're saying you're having communion this way uh, and these were not small problems these were big problems Right? There were people within the church causing problems. There were people outside the church causing problems. Uh, so I would say, yes, temperament-wise, the Apostle Paul may have been very, very, uh, very stern. Very Because remember, he's also a commander, highly learned, very intellectual. But he didn't use that in the wrong way. Right? When you see the end of uh, Second Corinthians, he's so joyful because he gets a report saying that you know they have agreed to listen to your uh, statements and your all your, all the teachings that you have said 
there's a change within the church. So at the end of chapter 2, he's so joyful. And he says to them, I'll come and visit you. Right? So it was just at that moment, Paul thought, okay, I've already visited them. They are sad. I'm sad. Uh, if I correct them now, maybe it's going to cause, they may not even take the correction or that's going to cause a conflict within us. So it's better I write to them. So uh, what we can learn is, Mangi, first time when we're correcting people, let's do it in truth, in love, maybe in a little more polite way. Uh, it looks like, now we must also understand the, the, the style of writing of Apostle Paul has always been that way, right? Uh, remember, this is a translation again. So the original Greek have different kinds of meaning. So sometimes uh, it to us, it sounds harsh. Remember Jesus? Uh, uh, many times he has, you know, things that he has said, it sounded so harsh. So why is Jesus saying like this? You know, uh, I think it's Matthew 24 or 25, where he's you know, rebuking the uh, the Pharisees and he's saying, you are hypocrites, you're a brood of, uh, you know, like serpents and all of that. Now, uh, again, it's the style of language that is being used at that time. Right? Why does he call his mother woman? Right. Uh, during the uh, wedding at Cana. So uh, he says, woman, my time has not come. Now if we say woman, it, it's to your own mother. It's 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 rude. It's impolite. Uh, so again, language could be the uh, another uh, reason. But I would say when you are correcting people within the church, believers, first time, do it out of love, do it out of kindness. Again, be polite. We don't have to follow how the apostle Paul did it. You can do it politely kindly uh, but one of the things that we have at APC is and things that we follow is we follow the three strike policy right so somebody does a mistake you get a warning uh, 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 meaning if it's a, like a serious mistake right so uh, and then if there's a second time we give them a final warning and the third mistake is uh, they will have to you know, resign or uh, put down their paper so we we also so, you know, believers, do we love the church? Yes, of course we do. Uh, but without rules, there will be chaos. Uh, and that's what was happening, Mackie, in the church in Corinth. There was complete chaos. You know, a few group of people are saying, Paul, Paulus, uh, Cephas, and another group is eating the Lord's table like as if it was food. And uh, another group is saying, who are you, Paul, to tell us what to do? And then another group is uh, talking about, uh, you know, uh, things that uh, sexual immorality within the church and divisions within. So there was chaos within the church. And I believe Paul was torn because, uh, you know, he knew that Corinth was, it's an important place. He knew that the church had to be strong. And we're seeing the problems within the church itself. So maybe it really upset him. Uh, yes. Yes, Christopher. Uh, yes, Pastor. I just wanted to uh, uh, just understand uh, how uh, you know this would apply to um, you know current day um, you know, mission trips and how we you know how we sort of uh, uh, you know select certain certain geographies to you know, to to go and uh, spread the word of God. Um, and um, is uh, I mean other times when we would I mean. I'm talking specifically now of APC or maybe other churches. Um, would they, uh, you know, uh, try to understand um, or use a, a little more uh, kind of uh, indirect approach when you know going into uh, into a new uh, territory or go directly there? Uh, how how is this done, and what you know what are some of the learnings that we could get from from you know what what Paul did and how we can apply it in, in the current in the current time. Yes. yes, that's a wonderful question, Christopher. Now we know that Paul was always led by the Spirit, right? So remember in Ephesus, um, they were wanting him to come, but he says, No, I, I have to there's a great door open here. Uh, so I will stay here, even though there is persecutions and people are like wild peace. Then he says uh, 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 you know, he gets the Macedonian call, somebody from Macedonia saying, come over, for there's an opportunity here. So we know that the Apostle Paul was very strongly led by the Spirit, right? 
uh, and so when I when we transfer it to the times that we are in now, so for example, APC missions, right? So uh, we get a lot of uh, emails and options. You know, people, uh, as you know, that pastors' books. Actually, to tell you the truth, uh, pastor pastors' books. These books are we say we give away more Hindi books than English. So everyone in, especially in North India, uh, uh, they know Pastor Ashish. Right? So a lot of ministries, they ask, can you come? Can you come? Now, we can't go to everything. Right? So there, there are things that we have to look after here. And then there are things that we have the churches here, the ministries here that has to be done. Uh, so yes, we do look for uh, you know places where we haven't ministered or even places where we've ministered, we, we see whether uh, we're able to impact. So one of the things we did was uh, the short-term Bible college at Varanasi. So we thought we'll start this, right, to equip people. So the 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 strategy to enter can be different, right? So it's obvious that Apostle Paul didn't start a Bible college uh, to go into these towns. He just went and preached the gospel. That's what he did in Athens, Greece, his first, second, and third, everywhere. He just preached the gospel, uh, but he did it with wisdom. Right, so you look at uh, Athens. You know when he's he's preaching in Mars Hill, in Aeropag, in front of all the intellectuals. He says, "The God who you say is an unknown God, let me tell you who that God is." And uh, he uses context and preaches the word of God. So, I think Christopher, uh, yes, we also as APC we get a lot of opportunities, but again we fine tune. We see you know where we can work, where you know we're able to you know sow more seeds. Uh, how the how we can be more effective. Uh, so one of the things that we always uh, focus on, uh, especially in our missions, is North India, right? We we don't do anything in South India, right? So we know that even if there are doors open in South India, we normally don't take it up because there's lots happening here. But we want to do something in North where you know maybe uh, places that have not been reached. Uh, I think uh, there were some. There are some of you here who have been part of the short-term Bible college in Varanasi. Kishan has helped out there as well, and uh, uh, you know uh, we've seen people's lives being touched. We've seen uh, you know people giving their lives to Christ, and so powerful. So I think Christopher, it's not only the conferences. You can have those, but we can we can really see uh, you know enter places through. Different ways, right? So, Bible college, conference, pastors meeting, youth meetings. Right? Initially, we, you know, we went to it was Orissa. We started doing. Uh, it was it was just after the persecution, I guess. Uh, a couple of years later, after the persecution, 2010, there was again a persecution. So, I remember 2011, 12, we went to Orissa. We just thought we should go. We should do something for the believers there, and we did something uh, like uh, a youth meeting. And to our surprise, you know, we, we were quite apprehensive whether people will come because of the persecution. And uh, there were almost 200, 250 or the youth who had, who had come, uh, which was unexpected. And uh, so, so what I'd like to say is, Christopher, that uh, entering into different places, we can prayerfully ask God for wisdom and strategies uh, to enter in. And Apostle Paul, again, as I mentioned, he did it uh, just by preaching the gospel. But now we have many other ways, right? Uh, conferences, meetings, youth meetings, uh, other kinds of, of meetings we can have uh, that can you know, really uh, bless places that are that have not received the gospel. And most likely, you know, North India, it is. Uh, you know, there's a lot of miracles, a lot of healings, deliverance, all these wonderful miracles happen. But one of the things we notice is that they need the teaching of the Word of God. So that was the reason why we started through the Bible College. Right? So there are many places uh, that we can try different things. Uh, and some may work, some may not work. Uh, but again, prayerfully doing that. This I hope that helps. Yeah. So, so could you give us an example of maybe... Uh... Uh, certain areas or certain practices that have been, you know, that are being done in a in a particular geography, in a particular territory, yeah, and uh, which so, is not which is not godly. And um, uh, how do we address this? I mean, in this case, I mean, just related to you know how Paul, uh, you know, 
was very direct and possibly also you know quite uh, stern about it yeah. um how did we sort of address that and how did we kind of you know uh, what was the impact of that and how you know what was the outcome of that yeah, yeah. so uh, i i remember one christopher i think it was uh the one where paul writes and he says i do not allow a woman to preach now when you look at places especially in north india uh it's most likely they don't want women to be preachers right uh, of course now things are a little open people uh, are open to uh, receiving the gospel and they're more open to women preaching but initially uh, you know i remember when we went there uh, there was no uh, thing of women to preach it, it, it was not allowed or it was it was just that okay if she's she can read the bible verse or maybe uh, she can lead, you know lead the worship maybe that's maximum uh, but not uh, because pastor means it should be a man right? or evangelist means it should be a man so that was the kind of setting or understanding that was there in many places in north india so i remember we went uh, to these places and uh, uh, you know after after teaching them especially the book on code of honor or uh what's this other book understanding the prophetic uh, so we would teach them and they they will be surprised so god can use women also to start churches and uh, and so many a times that understanding has brought a release right and we have also told them right see this is what it is this is what god's word is now i wouldn't say that everyone accepted it but many times they came up to us and said see we don't agree with this right uh, they've come up to us they've said that uh, all the teaching is good but we don't agree with this what you have said so we 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 tell them see that we have what we have been teaching is from god's word you can go back home prayerfully just uh, think about it and see what god is leading you towards so one thing that we do at apc is we don't pressure people to you must believe this right now another thing would be uh, i think in north india there's a thing of uh, uh, the lord's table you know at one time there was a you know women must not uh, give the lord's table you know they must not be distributing it so there was this all these kind of things and we we did teach them about it many of them have received it many pastors have said we have changed the way and we are giving opportunities for women as well but many of them said to no let this role be for man because paul said women i don't allow you to preach so they haven't been able to understand the context uh and so one thing we do is we just leave that up to god but we do tell them the truth and we have received both one we have received uh, they've said okay like what you've said is right two we, some of them have said no this is not right uh, and they've openly come and said to us also it's not right so well, it's okay right we we must understand that everyone are on different spiritual levels um so we just you know move on we we don't really pressurize them to say, and make them say no you have to believe this no we don't do that so uh, that's that's few of the things that i can think of uh, this part, so i hope that helps okay so shall we carry on uh, we'll just try to finish this chapter uh, it's a small chapter okay okay so now verse 4 for out of much affliction an anguish of heart i wrote to you with many tears look at the heart of paul with many tears not that you should be grieved but you might know the love which i have so abundantly for you paul is saying i wrote that hard letter out of love for the corinthian church i didn't want to offend you i didn't want to cause sorrow to you but he did this because for him it was it was too painful to hear the reports of what was happening in the church so paul was motivated by love for the believers and he wanted to correct them so that they could walk in righteousness and so now he's you know saying i you know because i love you because the you know i'm uh, i didn't want you to be sorrowful that's why i wrote the letter in a hard way right uh, he so some you know somebody had asked me this why didn't paul say initially itself you know because of the love of christ because i'm burdened by this that's why i'm writing to you like this uh, he could have done that but now he's explaining it in a second letter verse 5 but if anyone has caused grief he has not grieved me 
but all of you to some extent not to not to be too severe this punishment was punishment was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man so that on the contrary you ought rather to forgive and comfort him lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow right so this man uh who was in the church repented who had you know probably caused a lot of conflict and a lot of uh, strife within the church has repented and paul is exhorting the church now he's saying you forgive him comfort him reaffirm him the love of christ so what is the important lesson we learn here that in a church sin must be addressed in a sensitive yet stern manner now we see paul he initially he was stern but he was also sensitive and but he did both right uh, any problem within the church must be addressed in a sensitive yet firm manner right i remember this one time uh there was this uh there was this i think an uh, elderly gentleman who had you know come into church and uh what he would do is after church he would keep talking to people and telling them you know come to this church come to that church you can you do this do that and uh, so many times i just overlooked it right this is a micro and i overlooked it oh uh, but there was a time i had to say uh, i i just called him and i said no he was an elderly gentleman so i was very respectful and i said see people who are coming here are part of this church right so you don't have to tell them about other churches now i understand that we now we all are one body right but there's divine order in the church so i had to address this problem and i remember doing it in a very sensitive manner yet i was a little firm but this elderly gentleman was you know he got a little upset and said no i was just talking about it and uh, you know. so i mean there's nothing wrong talking about other ministries and you know and, but what he would do is he would tell them you don't come here you come here because the worship is better or the word is better they have many and then it was causing trouble and many of our church folks come came to me and said you know you know this elderly gentleman is saying come here come there but we don't want to go why does he always say that every week uh, so i had to address that problem so there will be times uh, in the church in the small group or the ministry that we're leading uh we will have to address problems but we do it in a sensitive and stern manner right when there is genuine res- repentance you will see a visible transformation the church extended forgiveness and this person uh was brought back into fellowship right now it's not mentioned who is this person it could be the person who uh, paul said uh, you know hand them over to satan could be them or it could be just somebody else but there were people who uh, had repented of their ways and the church had accepted them back verse 9 and 10 for this and i also wrote that i might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things now whom you forgive anything now whom you forgive anything i also forgive for if, if indeed i have forgiven anything i have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of christ now uh paul is saying if you have forgiven them as believers i have also forgiven can forgiven him right uh this whole thing of repentance paul is saying you know you as believers you forgive them then what more i cannot have unforgiveness in me i forgive him because of your sakes and for the sake of christ right so now it looks like paul is you know uh giving putting emphasis on the believers Of, of the church is saying you are you are uh, you know important in my eyes you are your decisions your plans are important so if you forgive them i will forgive them right uh, verse 11 lest satan should take advantage of us for we are not ignorant of our of his devices so paul is saying if we continue in forgiveness unforgiveness satan will take advantage of us and then uh, the church will get into a problem unforgiveness gives satan an entry point Uh, a foothold as we like in ephesians says so so the church are forewarned about the schemes of the enemy we are to forgive and forget paul is saying if we don't forgive we're giving an entry point to the devil 
Then he's exhorting again the church. He's saying there is triumph in Christ. Now he's explaining a few more things. Furthermore, verse 12 and 13. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. Right. So we see here that Paul had a concern and he was upset that Titus was not there at Troas as planned, but Paul moves on to Macedonia. Right, verse 14 and 15. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Now, Paul gives a picture of the Roman triumph parade while declaring about the victorious leading of Christ. Now, it says that uh, this portion here, let's read that, right? It's, it's really interesting. What is this triumph, right? In a triumph, the procession of the victorious general marched through the streets of Rome to Capitol. First came the state officials and senate, then came the trumpeters, then ca the, they carried their spoils from the conquered land, then they came from, uh, for the then came pictures of the conquered land and models of conquered citadels and ships. Then after that, okay, so I'm just skipping, I'm going down. After that came the general himself. So it was like a triumph, like, you know, everyone walking down the streets of Rome. Uh, and this is the picture which Paul has in mind. All these generals, these leaders, these soldiers, the princes and, uh, uh, you know, animals and the spoils of the land, of the conquered land, everything. Just everyone walking together in procession on the streets of Rome. And Paul is saying, the Lord Jesus Christ leads us in a triumphant procession. Imagine you and I, all of us as believers, we are walking this, this race, this, li this, this, this life that we have through Jesus Christ, our leader who is triumphantly walking for us. The knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ is like fragrance. It is through the church that the Lord makes himself known and manifests himself. And you and I diffuse the aroma of Christ wherever we are. So now Paul is telling the believers, so, so beautifully he's exhorting them. He's saying, you are being led triumphantly by Christ. Right? We are all triumphant. Triumphant. We are all victors. And because of that, he will diffuse the aroma of Christ, a, a pleasant smell. We will be pleasant in the city, in the nation, in, in, in the places that we go. We will be victors. And verse 16 To the one, we are the aroma of death, leading to death. And to the other, we are the aroma of life leading to life and who is sufficient for these things so paul is saying for those who are believers we are the aroma of life to the unbelievers they may they may be people who don't accept the gospel we may be the aroma of death right the gospel is good news which leads to life to those who receive it but to those who don't receive it it is condemnation an eternal separation from God. Right? So we are either the aroma of death or the aroma of life. And so Paul is exhorting the church. He's saying, you are the aroma of life. You are the aroma of Christ because you are bringing people into God's kingdom. The word sufficient here is competent and fit. Are we competent enough to minister, to share the aroma of Christ in every place? The Lord Jesus is the one who makes us competent. So it's, you know, Paul is saying we are sufficient. Right? And who is sufficient for these things? We are fit. We are competent. We have, uh, do we have mistakes? Yes. Remember Paul has been telling them, you are like this, 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 you know, just uh, saying so, bringing so many corrections. But now he's saying you are sufficient. You are competent. You are fit for bringing the aroma of Christ every place you go. Now imagine the readers, how will they be feeling? 
there will be so much of joy. Oh, it looks like Apostle Paul has calmed down. Uh, this is who we are. This is who we are in Christ. And they, they are reading this and saying, hey, I am the aroma of Christ. And finally, verse 17, for we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, as from God, we speak the sight of God. The word peddling is, uh, the Greek word is kapaleo, which means corrupt and adulterate, right? Uh, we are not, Paul is asserting, he's sending the church. We are not doing this as a team. We are not peddling the word of God. We are not, uh, we do not adulterate. We did not water down. We do not corrupt the word of God, but we esteem it as God himself, uh, as, you know, as something of high priority and with great sincerity, with great humility, we preach this gospel, right? We are not making a profit out of it. We are not making it as a business. We are not, uh, you know, we are not sharing only, uh, you know, good things. But we are doing everything. Uh, we are not watering down the gospel. We are not just uh, holding on things for ourselves. But we are sharing everything uh, that the Word of God has in sincerity, integrity, but out of love. And he brings this ch chapter to a close. Right, so we'll stop here. We'll pick up from chapter three from next week, and, uh, and we'll see. Paul goes on, right? Chapter three onwards, he begins to address a few problems, but he's not as stern as the first letter. But he addresses a few problems. But every now and then, you'll find him saying, you know, you know the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We are mighty in God. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? So, so he's changed his, you know, way of writing the second letter. He's bringing correction, but he's also bringing in truths, and uh, truths of God's word. You know what, what God is and what He can do. So there's a combination of this in the second letter. So, right? Any questions? Any thoughts? Uh, I can close. All right. Okay. Shall we just close in prayer? Right. Father, we just want to thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, for what we have learned today. Uh, this wonderful letter of Second Corinthians, oh God, Lord, there's so much that we can learn, oh God, and I pray, God, that each one of us will walk in wisdom, will walk in authority, yet walk in love, that we will bring correction and truth and love, and Lord, that we will uh, truly be the aroma of Christ wherever we are, oh God. We thank you for your word that is so powerful, that just teaches us, exhorts us, oh God, and I pray for each one here, oh God, all the students, even as they continue to study and prepare. Uh, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will empower them, you will teach them, you will, oh God, in your own way, just uh, just minister to them. God, we thank you, Father. Uh, we give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, have a great week ahead. I'll catch up next Sunday, next Monday. God bless.